Hey, everybody. There we go. That woke up some of the folks in the back. Excellent. How's everyone doing tonight? Good. Yay. Sunday night, Trying Con. Everyone survived. Hooray. Uh, so, my name is Andrew Greenberg. I've had the privilege of doing this video or some other version of this with the EFF track for 15 years now, I believe. We tend to think it's the most important uh, event you can attend at Dragon Con, so thank you all for coming to this. As you have seen with the, the video, uh, this information might not necessarily keep you from getting arrested, and being arrested will ruin your day, your night, your weekend, your month, but being convicted will in many ways ruin your life. So the focus here is really on safeguarding your rights and ensuring uh, your own protection. One thing you'll also notice in this, that we do have the belief that uh, people being well informed and knowing how to deal with what for many people is the most stressful event they'll go through keeps them safer and it also keeps the police safer. So we think this is a service for everyone involved in these matters to do these. Um, so as I said, I've, I've served in a number of, uh, I do serve in a number of appointed county and government positions, but I'm also a game designer, so my Noble Armada game will be coming out September 13th, look for it on Steam. <laughs> I do want to, <laughs> hey, all right, Sorry, I do want to uh, let the rest of our panel introduce themselves. We have a surprise guest we'll start with. Yes, indeed, everyone, it is the evil cop who busted the old woman at the end of the video, <laughs> Captain America. <laughs> <laughs> Hi folks, my name is Pat Berry. I am a <laughs> uh, I am a retired state trooper. Um, that's why I, they booked that gig, I think. Uh, I've been a professional actor for a little over a decade. And uh, yeah, I participated in that because it's uh, really important that uh, everybody knows. Because when I swore to uphold the Constitution, it included everything in that, in that constitution, especially people's rights. Um, right now I'm working for a federal police agency that I prefer not to bring up or else they'll probably get mad at me. Uh, but uh, I, I show up at this uh, con almost every year and the funny thing is he, he always likes me coming up, but he, he never invites me back. So I, <laughs> I'm not sure how to take that, but he always, I never show up, he's like, oh, come on up, it's come God's on up. Fault. You know? I blame the guy uh, with the camera. Okay, all right, so anyway, moving on. <laughs> Where's your warrant? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Hi, I'm Cara Chapel. Um, I'm a senior, lit par senior litigation paralegal that matriculated into a uh, Freedom of Information Coordinator for the City of Virginia Beach. I've been Andrew's sidekick on and off for a number of years, um, so I'm happy to be back again. Hey, can I borrow your microphone? Sure. Yeah, we'll share. They didn't give the other cop a microphone. They <laughs> didn't give that one either. Yeah, I know. They put him in the corner. You have the right to remain very silent. Um, <laughs> my name's Jonathan McFarland. I'm a law enforcement officer in Georgia uh, for a county police department. I've been in law enforcement for just about 12 years. I was on patrol for about eight of that and served as a field trainer for about four years of that eight. Uh, for the last four years or so, I've been in the special victims unit as a crimes against children detective. I also um, am part of a state um, task force for internet crimes against children and a federally led task force for human trafficking enforcement in the Atlanta area. I'm Ron Daniels. I am, uh, I, I'm an attorney down in middle Georgia. I do civil litigation, suing abusive debt collectors and helping people maintain their privacy. But I'm also a conflict public defender for Houston County which means I get the trigger man usually who has not watched this video at all. <laughs> um, and I do some federal appointed criminal defense work. Uh, my name is Matthew Conley. I do nothing that's special like you guys do. Uh, <laughs> I primarily do computer security for DOD environments, but I've also been volunteer fire EMS stuff. And that's been my, most of my involvement with uh, police and such as that type. Okay. I don't think they can hear you. Okay, can I hear now? Yeah, love the okay. mic. Love right. the mic. Well, I don't like mics. Jeez. <laughs> it's really hard, you know. You don't want to be picked up by a mic. <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, background of fire and EMS on the volunteer side. So that's primarily my background in uh, dealing with police. And an investigator. Yep. All right, so uh, we, this is primarily your opportunity to ask questions. Officially, we only have about uh, 
15 minutes, but I think if we're really nice to Scott and the rest of the gang, they'll let us go a little longer. I do want to talk about one thing, which is the IDs. We always get questions about this one. In Georgia, uh, you can get convicted if you don't identify yourself when a police officer asks you to, whether you're driving or not. It is bizarrely enough, and you can all can correct me if I'm wrong, a trespassing charge, as I've been told. What, do you, what is it if you're a... Not that I'm more okay. It's obstruction. It's an obstruction. It's obstruction. It's misdemeanor okay. obstruction. You have to have RES for that. But... Uh, but it isn't necessarily an ID. There's nothing that requires you to give an ID in the law. So it's usually a good idea, but. All right, so we'll take the questions. Oh, and please note the thing that says, not legal advice, no attorney-client privilege. Uh, just to make clear, I'm not here representing my department in any way. This is just me having fun at con. Same here. <laughs> so, so they give you that advice that you don't consent to searches, but what's the evidence that you you, you say that it's just his you know your word against theirs if they choose to say that you did consent to it so what's your what you know what are your options then if you don't and they still say you did uh i'll, I'll jump on that first and glad to let the others take it as well uh again it is your word against theirs but we've dealt with lawyers we work with a couple of lawyers uh dave clark and winston getz who have been involved especially in uh, cannabis uh defenses who say that they have never lost uh, a, a DWI driving while intoxicated case for a client who did who did not consent to the searches, and uh, generally they say it's a major assist for them. I'm glad to let anyone else handle that. Well, one. I'll just say like a, a police officer who asks that question gets a no and then lies and says you did anyway is I mean obviously they're violating law, they're incredibly unethical, but they're also putting everything at risk for themselves personally. Um, so. Uh, well, I mean, I can tell you that that's not something that I've ever been a part of in my department. I would never have, certainly would never have occurred to me to ever do that. And that's, we don't have a culture where I work where that would be any, nobody would ever consider that acceptable where I work. Uh, I, I've watched about 80 stop videos this year uh, on new cases. Um, I have not seen a single one where the video went missing when something like that happened. Um, I will tell you that it is certainly possible for it to happen, but now that everything is recorded, you've got folks with body cams. If they're in a car, they've got a recorder going. It would be highly unusual. I'm sure it's possible, but that's one of those things, if they're going to lie about that, it's going to be a credibility determination for a judge. Uh, if they're lying about it once, they're probably not having a bad night. Um, it, they're probably a problem. The prosecutor's probably going to be aware of that. The judge is probably going to be aware of that. The police actually have a very, the police actually have a very um, high standard. It, it is on a uh, high standard when it comes to uh, chain of custody, and if there is any question to that chain of custody of the evidence, then that evidence can be thrown out of court and not used against you. Yeah, and, and just to be clear. This isn't a jet get out of jail free card. What we're doing is we're building layers of defense for you. Every piece of this is a part of that defense. So you're trying to build an entire fortress, not just to get out of jail free card. Thank you for the panel. Um, you mentioned about the recording. I'd like to tie that into my question. Um, you see the videos where when police are talking to somebody, everyone gets out their video cameras. Um, but with everything going on with um, with drugs and the opiates and all that and now that tying into DUI even with drugs for depression or anxiety or any kinds of that stuff um, how do you handle an encounter um, to not get a DUI because of prescriptions and can you record it with or without telling the police officer that you're recording um, as you're being pulled over um, if they see a weekly pill container that has your pills laid out um, you know is your mom going to get arrested um, for having that in her, in her console or how what's the best response for that thank you, yeah. you want I, I, I can take this one for Georgia and let me be clear that I don't, I'm not licensed to practice any other state I don't know the law in any other state if your pills are in a different container that's actually a crime in the state of Georgia as odd as it is usually you won't get prosecuted for it if you have a valid prescription they're really looking for people with opiates things like that not anti-anxiety medicines, normal medicines. Um, the thing really to watch out for when you're recording somebody else is in what law of the state applies. In Georgia, you can record somebody. You don't have to ask them. 
just put your phone in the seat, turn it on. I wouldn't be playing with it on your dashboard, and I would make sure you're stopped in the state of Georgia because we have a new hands-free <laughs> law that went into effect <laughs> last month, and they really like writing tickets for it. Um, no offense. Uh, <laughs> uh, I've been written four years. Well, before. well. Um, <laughs> The, but the the thing you asked it brought it up that you know how do you protect yourself on like a DUI charge like that? The best thing I can tell you about DUI charges is you don't have to do in the state of Georgia the stand on one leg hop turn thing. Don't ever do that if you can avoid it. It is set up. It, it is it, it is set up to give them clues because most of those things people can't do when they're sober. Yeah. You may have a strange gait. You're not going to walk straight on line. Uh, avoid things like that. Now, if they see a pill container in somebody's car, they may ask about the pill container. You know, I, my general stance on telling folks, and I've been pulled over a couple of times, uh, sometimes for valid reasons, sometimes because I piss somebody off. Um, you know, I try to make it a business transaction, get in and out as quick as possible. If they ask me a question, I give them a yes or no answer. If it's something I think they should know. If they ask me if, you know, hey, is that a pill container in there? Yes, those are my prescriptions. Or yet, no, you know, yes, that is, that's my son's prescriptions. Or, you know, something simple like that, get in and out, don't volunteer any more information than you have to. Because it's, you know, you don't want them to rip apart your car. Um, and you don't want to tell them stuff that's going to make them question you. So I'll, I'll hit a few of the various issues on a DUI. First of all, in Georgia, again, if you are pulled over, you are required to show your ID, your driver's license. If you don't show it, you can lose your driving privileges for a year. This is the implied consent doctrine. So whether you're sober, whether you're following all the laws, just not showing your ID can lose it. Uh, you can lose the privilege of driving for, you're right, I don't think this is working. All right, there we go, for an entire year. Uh, secondly, uh, well, that's also the testing. If they, you, they will ask you to test and um, you don't want to do the stupid test and uh, it's up to you what level of test you want. Again, if you refuse test, you're losing your, you have the, uh, they will cost you your license for a year. So. However, if you have a prescription for the substances that you're taking and if you're not over the limit, the legal limit for what's in your system, um, you will not, I mean, it's a nuisance factor, but you should not, I don't want to say will not, but you should not lose your license for, you know, what's in your system. Should not, provided you haven't been doing the knucklehead factor. Would, um, just to be clear, the, so the administrative license suspension is related to if an officer places you under arrest for DUI after the arrest occurs, this is all in Georgia, by the way, this is not relevant for other states necessarily. Um, they're going to read something off of a card to you called the um, implied, implied consent. consent. They're basically saying, hey, I'm, I'm requesting a test of your bl bl blood, breath, and or urine. They're going to pick one or all of those. Um, you can or give you the option. Yeah, or give you the option. You can say no. If you say no, then you're, there is an administrative suspension of your license. There are hearings that you can fight that, and you know it, it'll go to court and everything, but that is a separate process from the criminal proceeding related to the, the criminal charge of DUI. In terms of medications, I know this is the cop answer, but make sure you're not impaired is definitely one factor. I mean, that's a public safety issue. If you know that your medication is contraindicated with alcohol or other drugs, be careful not to do that. Um, don't pound whiskey after you've taken your Xanax, like, you know. Um, but if you're, if you're taking a prescribed dosage of a medication and you've talked with your doctor and made sure that you are in fact um, safe to drive with the dosage that you're taking, um, you know, communicating that to an officer, uh, you know, I'm, most of the time would be helpful. And, and in Georgia, too, you can get a DUI and not be over the limit on anything. We have a DUI less safe. Um, so if, let's say, you, you hit the yellow line a little bit, they pull you over, they do a, you know, they do a roadside pullover, suspect you of driving under the influence. Let's say you blow and you don't blow high enough to be over the limit. They can still write you a DUI less safe because they thought you were driving in a fashion that was you were impaired and you were a danger to others. Although t typically less safe, at least in my jurisdiction, typically less safe charges are, are used in the case of accidents. Um, when somebody causes an accident and they might not be at the legal limit. Also, just to touch real quick, um, there is no testing for drugs in terms of a, a number that's only for alcohol. 
Like, so there's no way to say you're a, like a 1.0 of Xanax or whatever. Um, it's only related to alcohol that you'll hear those numbers thrown around. To quickly speak on the uh, issue regarding recording, uh, each state, believe it or not, does have a one or two party laws. There are even some states that have specific laws uh, about whether you can record the police in a certain incident or not. It depends on each state. Maryland had one at one point, then they changed it. California had one at one point, and they changed it. But generally speaking, each state you want to look up the laws that you might be driving through. Like, is that a one or two party state? And you're because it even counts if you're just like, hey, you're recording random so and so, and they're out there doing like goofball stuff, and then people in the background are walking by. Like, you didn't necessarily have their consent, you know, to uh, to record them. So keep that in mind as well. Which can also be in and of itself a separate felony. But in Georgia, thank the newspapers that you do actually have some fairly robust rights to record. If you're involved, you can record it. If it's in a public space, you can record it. And, that, and it doesn't have to involve you if it's in a public space. Now, if you're going to broadcast it, then you should get their uh, permission and all that kind of thing. But just for recording it for your own defenses, if you're involved, good. If it's public space, good. Uh, just to clarify clarification so uh, what if you're driving and you don't have a license on your person that is like you're going to the swimming pool or something and you just don't have a license and then the second part of that is uh, which I cop wants to beat him down for that <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then the second one is um, recently I, I got to, went to the electronic store to get my hands-free system and they said you know a lot of people are starting to buy these uh, external facing and internal facing cameras that uh, record yeah, constantly cameras. and do y'all have any any wisdom or recommendation? Is it worth 700 bucks? I mean, that's that kind of thing. So. Let's get the ID thing out of the way first. Okay. Simply having your full name and your date of birth, they're able to reasonably figure out that you are who you say you are. Um, but if you say your name is, you know, Ruth Collins, date of birth, you know, 18 years old basically, and that, and that, when, when I look at you, and a reasonable person wouldn't believe that, then they're probably going to take you in and fingerprint you to make sure that you're telling the truth. <laughs> but uh, generally speaking, and they can detain you for actually for a reasonable amount of time, according to the courts, um, in order to, to determine your identity, especially if you know it's fairly plain that you're lying about it. So, uh, but yeah, name and date of birth, and they can figure out. Oh, okay, he's you know about six foot two, white fella, brown hair, brown eyes. All right, that that's reasonable to believe that he is who, you say, who he says it is. Well, in, in Georgia, we have a um, the majority of uh, departments now. You have mobile computers in the vehicles. We're able to pull up a photo ID associated with your driver's license once we you know, get your name, date of birth. If you don't have your license with you while you're driving, that is an offense. It's a misdemeanor. Um, it's a traffic ticket. M majority of the officers that I've worked with and myself personally don't tend to write that. Um, I mean, obviously, people forget their wallets, they forget their license, and if you're upfront about who you are, what you're doing, in terms of the ID thing, that you forgot your ID, um, that would be, at least in my experience, that's not like a charge that anybody would be excited about. Yeah, I'd, no. I'd say 98% of the time, if you, that's a warning. Yeah, it, yeah, verbal warning, typically. And in regard to the camera, that is, your lifestyle and your level of risk and what you're involved with, it'll kind of decide how protected you want to be, and the EFF guys are great for suggestions on exactly what to use and have and so forth. It's good if you get into a traffic accident. I've, oh, I've yeah. Had, I've, had, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been Go involved as a, as a road officer. I've been involved, and I, I can recall two uh, traffic investigations where there was just a fender bender or, you know, moderate damage to vehicles. Somebody had the camera system like that, and I just could s sit in their driver's seat real quick, view it, and go, oh, yeah, that's exactly what happened, and know, you know, clearly what occurred. And your ch um, YouTube so channel will get a ton of hits when you post it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Uh, so my question is like hypothetical, like say I go to a bar and drink one beer or two beers and like that's it, and I'm done, and I feel fine and I drive. Once. <laughs> like, <laughs> like 12 it's ounce beer, always like two 5%. Beers. I'm just it's saying, like, I know, but like if I'm serious, like it really is only two. Two and shots, I, two beers, it's always <laughs> two. Always two. Yeah. <laughs> Never three. I, know, I don't do, more, if I don't drive after two, I'm just saying, if I did, like, you know, I did get pulled over, like, how would I go about that interaction, like, with the cop, or, like, what should I do, like? Well, I'll say when the police officer are asking immediately. you, <laughs> you, don't, you don't have to talk to the cop. You don't have to answer the questions. You can go straight into the, yep, yeah, uh, you can go straight into the mic being detained, free to go, et cetera. But if they want to search you, also bear in mind this is that um, a couple of Supreme Court cases, uh, I think it's 
Berguis versus Tompkins. Does that, does that sound right to you? Berguis yeah. versus, versus Tompkins. Um, you actually have to invoke your right to remain silent, which means you have to say, I am invoking my right to remain silent. In order to, um, for uh, Miranda to be necessary in an encounter, two elements must be present, custody and questioning, all right? A, a cop can ask you anything they want. If you're not in custody, they can ask you anything they, they want. Uh, but once you're in custody and they question you, different story. Then they have to give you Miranda. But if you are in a situation where you are being detained, legally detained, and you say to yourself, I'd like to invoke my Fifth Amendment right to remain silent. And then actually be silent. Yeah, and then shut up. All right, so we're getting the high sign to wrap up. I thought we were going to get to run a little longer. Scott, we're... Fifteen more minutes. Give us the one five sign instead. All right, all right, all right. All right. Oh, but with the... The what, what should you do? I mean, they're saying don't talk or anything like that. I mean, I, I've pulled over plenty of people who say that they have had two drinks. Um, they've blown into the intox. They've blown a .01 or a .02. And I've said, hey, just be careful and let them on. I mean, I mean, realistically, like, I understand they're going to tell you never, ever talk to the police. Um, and I understand why. And I can tell you that there are plenty of times where I've had conversations with citizens and determined that they're not a risk to the public and sent them on their way and haven't thought ill of them. So, I don't know. Take <laughs> but, it for what it's worth. But never lie to the cops. Never no. lie to the cops. Shut up rather than lie. Right. So realistically, so I was going to ask a different question of Ron, but I, now to follow up on this, so if you get stopped at, say, a sobriety checkpoint or something like that, right, and they, you, know, you roll down your window and they talk to you, what is the right approach to take there? Let's say you've had two drinks, right? Because I've been at a sobriety checkpoint before where I said, yeah, you know, I had a couple drinks and they're like, all right, you know, pull over. And then they did the field sobriety test and the whole business. And, uh, you know, at the end, I just, I, you know, they let me go, but it was uh, kind of an unpleasant experience and I'd rather not repeat that. So what's the right strategy to take with that? Take an Uber. <laughs> um, I, I've had it. I, I drank earlier. I, I'm, you know, I, I think the more less specific you can be, not vague, but, you know, less specific, the better your chances are. I mean, if you're going through a field sobriety checkpoint you're and you've been drinking, you're probably going to wind up having a difficult time regardless. There's, there's not a lot because they can smell it. I mean, y'all know. Y'all know. Y'all have been to bars. You know what happens. I mean, so, I mean, it, it's, it, it's hard to avoid that situation. Um, but I, I always tell people just, you know, be as vague as possible when you're talking about how much you drink because, and when you drink, because you might not be recounting completely when it was, uh, particularly if you're already driving inebriated, which you should not do. Um, I wouldn't be trusting your judgment to measure time uh, because they're not, because they're saying, you know, you can't drive, so. Again, we recommend, if you, if you ha it is up to you what you're going to say. If you're going to say something vague, like not recently, that's up to you. But generally, am I being detained? Am I free to go? Et cetera. As he said, we will say, he'll say what he has to say, and we'll say what we have to say, and it'll all work. <laughs> so um, say you do get stopped and you have something like a recording device in the car, or your phone's on recording or something like that, and a police officer is asking you questions, and you you say, okay, I'm going to remain silent. What questions do you have to answer, and what questions do you not have to answer? If they said, hey, what's that red light on the dash? Are you recording me? Can I just remain silent? For one thing, I would say, once again, read that part. Uh, the other part is that um, the thing you really do have to, if you have to answer any questions, have to do with your identity. Okay? Um, that's first and foremost. People like say, well, you can't answer, ask me anything, you know, like that. It's like, no, we can. We have to determine who you are if, you know, you're part of this investigation. So, yes, that's something you do have to answer. Um, most everything else, I mean, if, if, even if they have said a red light, you, you also have to understand that nowadays, in the days of body cams that are a big deal, you're probably being recorded too. A lot of times when they stop you, they say, you know, officer so-and-so, sergeant so-and-so, whatever, trooper so-and-so, you're stopping, you just mean stop for this thing, you're being uh, audio and visually recorded, 
you know, sometimes they say I have to, I'm required by law to inform you you're being audio and visually recorded. So that being the case, it's actually okay in that case for you to have your own uh, record of that, okay, which might be exculpatory evidence, which means it might help you, you know, uh, be exonerated of something, or, you know, it might just show what happened and, it might, and you know, and if, 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 if what you did was a crime, then it was a crime. But, uh, but yeah, the, the main thing you have to answer has to do uh, with determining your identity, all right? Oh, yeah, I, yeah, that's a... um, So my goddaughter keeps a photo of her uh, driver's license on her cell phone. Does that count to present to officers to show her identity? It doesn't In the state count for of Georgia, driving. it wouldn't. Yeah, it doesn't count for driving, for identity, but well, not for driving. I mean, she, she could be written for no driving li driver's license on, on person, which is that misdemeanor offense. Yeah. At, so, yeah, I mean, that would still be a, a, like a traffic ticket, yeah. potentially. Yeah, it, it's not going to count to be like, oh, it, it's not going to get them out of a ticket that says, you know, if the ticket says failure to um, show a license at, at request, then, yeah, they're, they're going to lose that one. Basically, they're going to lose that one. But having it just say, hey, yeah, this is who I am. And then once again, if they can reasonably believe after going through, you know, checking them through, uh, you know, all the uh, alph alphabet soup letter, uh, uh, yeah, NCIC, and let's, do they use inlets in it? We use clets anyway. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, all, all the alphabet soup different uh, computer systems, you know, then it's like, all right, it's reasonable to believe that, you know, Sophie so and so is Sophie so and so right in front of me. So I'm wondering if you could just shed a little light on the definitions between like a public space and a private space with like my personal vehicle and how that ties into recordings. All right, uh, basically since Vegas the judge wants it to be, a street is generally considered a public space, outside walking around is generally considered a public space, Dragon Con is generally considered a public space, your hotel room is not. Now, when you start getting into restaurants and things like that, bars, it's a little fuzzier. Those are generally considered public spaces, but they can, there can be times when they're considered acting in a private function. So there is some vagary to this. There's no, this is exactly the level. If you're in your garage, you're in a private space. If you're on the streets, you're public. If I can look in it and not get in trouble, it is generally considered a public space. But again, a, no legal advice applying here, and there are times when it's not going to be the case. Plain yeah, you, plain view. Do you drive an RV or a sedan? No. Okay, yeah, then it's public if it's on the roadway. Okay. Thank you. If I see a the, the, police... Oh. oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I, just really quick, there, there's also something in many different states, many different laws that say, that they call it private property used by the public in general, right? You guys have that here in, in Georgia? Um, so sometimes you might say, oh, gee, uh, that was private property, but is it like an American Legion post that is used for um, people to park on, you know, while they go over to watch this concert around the corner? Then, yeah, that's private property used by the public in general. That still counts as technically public in that case, just so you understand. Yes, I wanted to ask if you see a police sobriety checkpoint ahead of you, is there any reason not to simply stop or turn around and go the other way? Depends on how many chase cars they have. There's a lot of truth to that. Okay. Though, how, how well staffed is your department? I have been told that just turning around is not cause for a search. You all tell me otherwise, because this no, not, is one I don't know a, for sure. Not for a search, but they can stop you. But then they'll stop you, and yeah. then when you, if you're scared and getting wacky, that's when it becomes an issue. I, obviously, I'm not uh, counseling anyone to violate the law, um, but if you see a parking lot that you can pull into, um, usually they don't set them up that way, but, you know, if there's a road you can turn on and don't look conspicuous, um, I don't think you would get in trouble for that. But yeah, it depends on how many chase cars they've got. And, and just to be clear, the, the, legal, an, the legal answer in, in terms of police enforcement is if you divert your course after seeing the checkpoint, 
that is reason for the officers to conduct a traffic stop on your vehicle. They are legally allowed to, to pull over your car if they can articulate that, hey, this, this motorist saw uh, an enforcement checkpoint and then diverted course as a result. Uh, try not to break any traffic laws in doing so, basically, because all the they're, they're, they're all uh, cars that are like you know in certain uh, both sides taking a look, just to see oh did so and so yeah yeah there's another one you know and uh, but sometimes you can you can legally find a way around as long as you're not making an illegal U-turn, you're not doing a three-point turn in the middle of the road that sort of thing. Uh, <laughs> yeah, don't make it. You're, you're making it obvious at that point. You know, again, you're going to get stopped, and it's going to be a long process for it you. It is my understanding it's not grounds for a search. No. Um, if you're pulled over for speeding and you think you're going 10 miles over the limit, um, and you're not sure exactly, but you know, probably about 10 miles over, and the very first thing they ask you is, do you know how fast you're going? <laughs> what should you be saying? Like, I'm not sure, nothing, 10 miles over. I would and like then, to invoke my right to remain <laughs> silent. <laughs> and then if the officer is not great to you, is it really always a bad practice to ask for a badge number? Is that going to always turn them into like Dr. Jekyll? We get asked Hyde for badge numbers all the time. That's said, not that big of a deal. It's not. Okay. I mean, in, okay. again, I'm, I'm just speaking my, my, you know, 12 ish years in my little neck of the woods. And I, you know, I'm in one little area. I can't speak for the whole state. I can't speak for the region. I can't speak for the country. Just my little pocket of the world. Like we, I, I've been dog cussed on the road and <laughs> we just take it. We have to take it. It's and not, what I mean, is that? What's that? Dog, dog, cuss. dog cuss. <laughs> I can tell you Call afterwards. everything but the child of God. That's, that's what they say down here. And I've also been told in a lot of areas it's easier just to ask for a uh, business card from some of the officers. A lot of them don't, yeah. but a lot of them do have business cards. Oh, also, I mean, I started um, like way, way back when I first started in law enforcement. I used to ask questions like, like do you know why um, uh, why I pulled you over? That's a dick move. Um, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, sincerely, like it, it kind of gets it gets you off on the wrong foot. If I if I stop somebody. There's a reason I, I, developed, I had probable cause to stop them, and my little spiel that I worked out over the first year or so of working on the road was I identified myself, I, I introduced myself, I told them who I was, what department I worked for, and I said specifically, this is why I stopped you. And there's some, there's some really good training, there's some police training out there that justifies why that's safer for the officer, it's better for public relations. I strongly encourage other officers, that's how I trained the people I trained. So. You know. And a cop who'd ask that question would bust an old lady for weed. <laughs> um, we have time for one more question, and then we're going to do the uh, interactive part. <laughs> I was going to ask about civil asset forfeiture, and I <laughs> how oh, much I you given us? I can't answer that uh, <laughs> in in this a lot of time, but I have lots of thoughts, and it's up on cert to the United States Supreme Court right now. So any answer I gave you would. Will change be very soon. And <laughs> no. All right. So I guess one more question. We will have time for one more. So this should be a quick one, uh, kind of related to what was in the video. My general policy: if I'm at home, I live alone. If uh, I'm at home, someone knocks at my door. If I don't know them, no matter what costume they're wearing, whatever, if I don't know them, I'm not expecting anyone, I just don't answer the door. Is that generally a good policy? Probably. In reference to law enforcement? <laughs> Probably. Okay. <laughs> I mean, if, if I show up at somebody's door and I'm knocking on the door, and th I mean, just legitimately, um, you know, I might be trying to talk to you because one of your relatives reported that one of your other relatives had been sexually or physically abused, and I might want information from you to help figure out the truth of the situation. So, you know, uh, now, is, is that important to you? You know, I, I have no way of knowing though. Oh, yeah, no, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, exactly. So, and, and I mean, you know, we'll make phone calls and all kind of stuff, yeah. but I just mean like, you know. But would you leave your card if he doesn't come to the door? Oh, yeah. So he's gonna leave his card, you know, to call him back. And uh, I don't think it's a bad idea to not answer the door until they get on the bullhorn. Um, <laughs> And I answer the door generally up until a certain point at night, uh, and then it's like, well, you have no legitimate business in my yard. I, I'm not getting up, and my dogs are probably barking their heads off. Since you actually live alone, um, so you say. <laughs> no, yeah, uh, if you actually live alone, there are times that somebody who, who might care about you um, is saying, I haven't heard from so-and-so for this amount of time. They usually contact me, for, and it's a welfare check. 
I'm, that's what it breaks down to. But they, they say these sorts of things, and it's like, and they just want to make sure you're alive. I will tell you how many welfare checks that I've gone to, and there's a dead body sitting right there. So, and, uh, and they don't, and there, this one guy, I mean, I don't want to get too gross on you, you can stop me at any time, you know, knocked on the door, there, there's a pile of mail there, that's clue number one. You know, you're looking in the windows, and there's, you know, then I walked around back, and at the side window, there were a bunch of flies. Okay, you can stop. <laughs> and, and I'll I'll say quickly, most cops will call beforehand. So if, if, they can, if they calls, can, they'll try to call you. Going on beforehand, so if you haven't gotten yeah. calls, then you've got more reason to be questioned. The only times I've had that happen, the police have called first, or they've been active in the, in the neighborhood for whatever reason. So, All right, so uh, we are out of questions. We do have time for the most important part of this. As we said, the police are trained in these matters. You are not. Therefore, this is your training session. Ready to repeat. Again, it was an interactive performance there before. So the first thing that we will all repeat is, I do not consent to any searches. I do not consent to any searches. Next, am, <laughs> am I being detained or am I free to go? Am I being detained or am I free to go? <laughs> and uh, the next one is, uh, I am going to remain silent. I want to talk to my lawyer. I am going to remain silent. I want to talk to my lawyer. They didn't do it in here, but do you have a warrant is also an important one. So thank you all very much for joining us tonight. And we'll be around and spread the word about this panel. I think it's the most valuable one people can have here. And thanks to all our panelists.